All right. He was up here talking, uh, and she goes, we're going to start. All right. Welcome to Calvary Baptist Church, everybody. Let's open our hymn books to 421. 420. Let's all stand. No, I don't. Let's get into the spirit here, church spirit. The first Noel. Good morning. Good to be back with you once again, uh, people of God. I hope you've had a great week in the Lord. Uh, in many ways, it's been a very profitable one for me, and uh, and maybe some of that will come out in the message this morning, but I'm just glad to be back with you here today. 
I do have a card that I'd like to start off uh, uh, given to us, presented to us from Brian Kearns, a man we've been praying for for some time. And uh, many of you know him as the Egg Man. He will send eggs through the Allighausens, uh, and they will distribute them to various folks here. Uh, a good brother in the Lord, but he's really had his uh, health battles as of late. And he writes, Dear Calvary Baptist Church family, praying that you all have a very blessed Christmas and a safe, healthy New Year. Thank you all so much for your thoughts, prayers, love, and spiritual, emotional support throughout the year. Hope to be up in my wheelchair by mid-January and uh, hoping to see you all then. So keep praying, if you would, for Brother Brian Kearns. Um, hey, I... Well, I want to welcome all of you that are here this morning, but all of you that are also viewing online. Um, we have a lot of folks missing, and the reason why I say that is because on average, and I'm glad for this, but we've got uh, anywhere from 95 to 120 people that are viewing the service each Sunday. So uh, probably at the very least, uh, maybe 150 folks that are watching online. And uh, I wish they could be here with us, but I, I know many of them have concerns about the pandemic and the way it's escalated a little bit lately. Um, you know, I, I, did y'all hear uh, about the, <clears throat> the new Gallup poll that was released on Friday, by the way, that was in the news? Anybody hear anything about that? This is noteworthy, ladies and gentlemen. The Gallup poll stated that during the pandemic, the only group of people whose mental health improved were the people that were going to church. Amen. Uh, that, I, see, God made us in God's word. It works. His way works. Yeah. And... Uh, and so he wasn't talking about the people that were viewing online. It was the folks that were physically present uh, because we need, you know, that, that interaction with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. And so, you know, I, I probably aggravate some folks sometimes, but I've got a different view of this whole pandemic thing. And uh, I'm not saying the way that I think is necessarily the right way. So I don't want anybody to take offense to it, but... Uh, for me personally, um, I don't believe the pandemic's going to take me away from here unless God wants it to and when he wants it to. I, I'm not going to be foolish enough to go out there and test fate and, and get right up in somebody's face that's got COVID. I'm not going to go jump off of a bridge and tempt God that way. But uh, So we want to be balanced and use good common sense in everything that we do. But... I, I've come far enough in my life right now, and I, you know, I am of the age right now that um, there's a lot more time behind me than is before me, if you know what I'm saying. And, and a lot of people are scared of this pandemic, and for whatever reason, I, I'm, just, I'm just not. Here again, I don't want to be foolish. And those of you that have health problems, I understand you have to be, you have to be cautious. But I really have come to the place in my life where I totally embrace what Paul said for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. And I, I just, I'm not afraid of death. In fact, I feel like, you know what, if the Lord wanted to take me out of here with this pandemic, I would get to go to heaven. Man, I, I don't want to fight against that. Let, let me go. Just let me go. But that's my attitude. And, uh. You know, and, 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 you know, being the pastor, I, I suppose I need to be here, too. Uh, I, I can't shy away from the pandemic. I need to be here to, to preach. And, uh, but anyway, I, I'm glad just to be here with you this morning. But I thought that Gallup poll was extremely telling and interesting. So I want you to take that with you here today. Um, let me see, just a couple of things. Now, you've got several announcements in the bulletin. But I'll only highlight a couple of them. Please read all of them. But we're having the men's fellowship again next Saturday at 9 o'clock in the fellowship hall. Brother Jack Arks will be bringing the challenge in the morning. 
And, um, and then our Christmas program is next Sunday night, December, yeah, December the 20th, uh, next Sunday night. In the bulletin, however, it says 7 o'clock. We have moved that up to 6 o'clock next Sunday night just to keep you on your toes, just to throw you a little bit. But uh, it's going to be 6 o'clock next Sunday night. And for those of you that are interested and uh, not concerned about uh, the fellowship, we are going to have, for whom, whomever wants to come when the service is over, there's going to be some soup and cornbread and desserts over in the fellowship hall. If you want to come over there and join and, uh, and uh, just have a little bit of time of fellowship, we can space out a little bit. And when you get ready to take a bite, you can just pull your mask down, pull it back up. That's what you got to do. But uh, it, anyway, we, just, we need that fellowship with each other. And uh, so um, if, if you're concerned about that, of course, you, you don't need to, to come to that. But it will be available. I just want to let you know about that. So that's next Sunday night, 6 o'clock for the Christmas program and uh, 7 o'clock for the time of fellowship. Well, that's all the gabbing I got for now. So I'm going to sit down and have uh, whoever comes back to come. Brother Barry, is it? God bless you. All right. Let's take our hymn books once again. Let's stand once again. Open to page 424. 424. We'll come, all you faithful.
I was talking to Tina Souls yesterday on the phone. I had no idea, but she had spoken about the power of God's presence uh, at the Women in Christ meeting this past Tuesday night, and God was leading me in the same direction. She was speaking from the life of Moses. I'm, I'm going to be drawing more on, on personal experience today, and I don't know how tightly organized this message is, but it is from the heart. I have, uh, I was sharing this with my wife last night. I, I don't know what in the world's going on with me, but there's a warfare that is raging on the inside of my soul. And uh, I, I yearn for the power of God. I, I, I think I had a breakthrough last night in a time of prayer with the Lord. The heart is so deceitful and desperately wicked, ladies and gentlemen. And I think too many times I've wanted to get up and preach a great sermon so people could say how great Rick Phillips is and how spiritual Rick Phillips is. I don't, I don't care about that, any of that this morning. I, I told God, I said, it, when I get up to preach, Lord, I, I, I want it to be for your glory. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not the greatest speaker in the world by any means, not even close to it, but you know how pride can get in the way. And I don't want it to get in the way anymore. I want it to be all about God and nothing about me. As you know, lately God has been speaking to me, I guess, I, you know, as I've just alluded to, the desperate need for power in my own life. For the last three weeks, we've learned that if you're going to have the power of God, then you must, first of all, be desperate enough to desire it above all other things. 
And then you secondly must exercise faith in God's ability to impart his power. And finally, you must be aware of your own weakness. We talked about this last week and our inability to accomplish anything of eternal value without the power of God upon our lives. But this brief series would not be complete without directing your attention to two of the great resources of God's power, namely God's word and prayer. I told Jane last night, I don't want to go out a loser and a failure. I want to finish strong for the Lord. I don't want this church to fail. I want it to finish strong for the Lord. Mm -hmm. And for that to happen, ladies and gentlemen, we need to get down on our knees and just plead with God for his power and for his presence in this place. Uh, I knew it was going to be an emotional morning for me. I hope I can just get through this all right. But so be it. Let me clear my workspace here a little bit. God's been telling me something. I'm a slow learner, but it, it's eventually getting through. He's told me this. He says, if, Rick, if you want an unusual measure of my power, then you must spend an unusual amount of time in God's word and an unusual amount of time in prayer. And if you do, then God will draw an eye, and I mean so near that his presence will dominate the landscape around you. His spirit will definitely let you know, uh, let your spirit know that he is within arm's length. And when this happens, it'll be like nothing you've ever experienced before. I, I do want to go back and and draw from some, from some personal experiences. Uh, but let me tell you what, when God is near, it will mark your life. You'll never forget it. And when that happens, it'll be one experience above all others, at least for me, that you desire to happen over and over again. For God to be near. When God is near, all the cares and anxieties of your life will suddenly evaporate. And when God is near, he will inspire such awe that your mind will be too preoccupied to consider the problems in your life. And when God is near, there will be the inner confidence that he is control of all the storms of life so that at the end of the day, everything will be okay. And when God is near, you will be so heavenly minded that now you can be of some earthly good. If you have any doubts as to the reality of God, then encourage him to draw a nod, and those doubts will immediately evaporate. So how then do we encourage the presence of God to draw near? First of all, as I've already mentioned, through the power of prayer. Mark eleven twenty four, 24, Jesus says, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and ye shall have them. In John 15, 7, it says, If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. 1 John 5, verses 14 and 15, and this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if he hears uh if, if we know that he hears whatsoever we ask, that we know that we have those petitions that we desire of him. In 1 John 3, 22, it says, For whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 7, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. And Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 33, 3, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And finally, Psalm 37, 4, Favorite of many of us, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Are you not yet convinced? I hope by now, as you've been pounded by the word of God and by, by God himself, so what about prayer? I, I want to go back to earlier in my life because it's a, it has a lot to do with where I am now in my life. And 
those of you that have been here for a number of years, I apologize ahead of time because you've heard uh, these stories a couple of times already. But I began to learn something about the presence of God and the power of God when I was in college. Before I got to college, I'm not sure I had a clue. And it wasn't until I started getting right with God in college that I began to experience a little bit of the presence of God and the power that comes with it. You have... Uh, most of you are familiar with Morris Fleischer, who's been here several occasions as an evangelist. He was a good friend of mine. We went through college together, and we used to go to the Greenville County Jail on Friday nights there for a couple of years. And uh, I remember the first six weeks that we went to that jail, we would go there from 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock each night on Friday nights. And we preached for six weeks and absolutely nothing happened. It was three levels to the jail. You had the upstairs, you had the main floor, you had the downstairs where they kept some of the uh, worst criminals. Anyway, we preached, nothing was happening. During that six weeks, in the upstairs level, we would go up there to preach. And on the upstairs level and in the basement, they had, they had large common cells. Uh, you had a wide open area, and prisoners had little cubicles that they would go into, but they were all, you'd have maybe 30 prisoners in there all together. We went upstairs for six weeks and preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. There was a man who stood in the back of the room the whole time we were preaching at the top of his voice, cursing us, using other words that I can't even hint at this morning. Uh, you know, words describing uh, a, a, a husband's relationship with his wife, but used in a crude way every curse word in the book thought the man was demon possessed I, he was just yelling at us the whole time after six weeks Mars and I got together and said you know what maybe we need to get together during the week and start praying what a brainstorm most of y'all would have figured that out after the first week it took me about six so I remember those times well. We would go up to the uh, alumni building at night. The building was vacated. We'd get in one of those classrooms in the darkness of the room and just start crying out to God. The next week we went back, we went back up to the top of that jail, and there was that man standing on the back, by the back wall. We started to preach, but he didn't yell at us, he didn't curse at us, he didn't say a word. And by the time the preaching was over, he made his way to the front, in front of all those men that had heard him screaming for the last six weeks, and he said, I can't fight this any longer. I've got, I've got to be saved. And that was an eye-opening experience for me. I thought to myself, what power is this? Because I, it was unfamiliar to me up to that point. The next week we made our way down to the basement of the jail to the bullpen, they called it. And uh, we preached there. And like I say, there's about 30 men in that, uh, cube, in, in that bullpen. 
when the invitation was given, there were four men that came to the front and said, we'd like to be saved. And I remember Mars saying this as clearly as day. I mean, all this is so vivid as I go back in my mind. There are those other 26, 27 men standing around the back walls watching what's going on. And I mean, these are four convicts in there with all those other convicts. And yet God had so grabbed a hold of their hearts and they came forward. And Morris said this, he said, if you're serious about being saved, then stick your hand, your arm and hand through the bars and put them on the Bible as we pray. And they did not hesitate. And we began to pray together and those four men were converted to Christ because of the power of God and because of the presence of God. And then last of all, this is something I can never forget. We came out of there. It was one particular Friday night, weeks later. Morris couldn't go that night. And so there were three other uh, college students from Bob Jones that went with me to the Greenville County Jail. And we stayed for the allotted hour, and when 8 o'clock came, I was on the main floor, started making my way uh, out to the sheriff's office and uh, or, or lobby area and then out the front door. As I was leaving, there was a 17-year-old boy who was in a padded cell and just one little square cutout. That's all he could uh, look through to see the outside world. And he, 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 he stuck his arm out of that square and he said, do you have anything that I can read? You know, we, he knew we were handing out tracts in the jail as we preached. And I said, yes, I said, here's a, a gospel tract. If you'll read it, do what it says and mean it from your heart. God can save you today. But I said, I have to be out of here at 8 o'clock, and I hate this because I'd love to stay and talk to you, but I've got to go. Because they were pretty strict about that. And so I made my way out of the jail. The four of us walked up the hill about a half a block where we were parked, and I, we got in the car. And I told the guys, I said, I've got I've to try to go back. I don't know if they'll let me in there, but at least I've got to try. You know, all they can do is say no, I guess. So I told the three guys, I said, I need for you to pray. So I left them in the car praying. I went back into the jail. They just had a shift change at 8 o'clock. The new captain or sheriff on duty was sitting behind his desk uh, with a deputy close by. I noticed his, I, I've often chuckled about this, but I noticed his name tag had Phillips on there. And I thought, well, maybe, maybe that'll count for something because I'm Phillips, he's Phillips. I said, uh, look, I know this is unusual, I don't want to raise any of your suspicions, but this young man told me as I was leaving that he wanted to try to read and that, you know, given the opportunity, he wouldn't mind talking to me. I said, is there any way possible that I could go back there for a few minutes? And uh, Officer Phillips looked up to the deputy and I saw the deputy shake his head up and down. And he said, yeah, that'll be fine. We'll give you 20 minutes. So I went back into the jail, started pre uh, not preaching, but witnessing, sharing the gospel with this 17-year-old boy. And I would notice the whole time I was witnessing to him, he would... 
His gaze would go from my face up to the deputy that was standing behind me. I guess the deputy went in there because I wanted to come back a second time. He was going to stand there just to be sure that everything was on the up and up. So I'm witnessing this guy's looking at me, then he looks up at the deputy, then he looks back and he looks up at the deputy. And finally I got to the invitational time and I said, would you like to be saved? He said, yes, I would. And he prayed and asked God to save him. But I was in for the shock of my life when it was all over. I was getting ready to leave the jail and I turned to the deputy and I said really appreciate you letting me come back here and he said that's quite all right the young man that you just spoke to is my brother So, I went back up the hill to get in the car. I was rejoicing. It was uh, early stages of winter. So the windows were all rolled up. I approached the car. You couldn't see inside the windows. They were totally fogged up. And uh, I thought, well, this is kind of unusual, but I opened the door and those guys were in there still praying. Yeah. It, was, uh, it was the power of God. It was the power of his presence. You know what, people of God, I think we've lost faith in the power of prayer. You can blame that on me. But why are we any further along as a church than what we are right now? And I don't mean to be cruel because if anybody is to blame, the buck stops right here at the pulpit. We got to get back to praying. We got to get back to people. And I don't care what the risk is, getting back to Wednesday night and seeking the face of God and pouring their hearts out to it. The second thing is the power of the Word of God that brings with it the presence of God. Hebrews 4.12, you know it well, for the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. You know, I love what Jeremiah has to say about the power of the Word of God. I, I, I was reading through Jeremiah in college, and it really got a hold of my heart. In fact, uh, uh, of all the characters in the Old Testament, Jeremiah is my absolute favorite. Uh, there's no one that competes with him in my book for what I need. Uh, first of all, there's certain things about Jeremiah that I can relate to. There's certain things that I don't relate to, but uh, wish that I could. And uh, I mean, I wish I had the heart of Jeremiah. But you find that theme about the Word of God real big in Jeremiah. You find the phrase, the Word of the Lord, and usually it's the Word of the Lord came unto me. But in Jeremiah, you find it 47 times. I mean, you can't go far in the book of Jeremiah without being hit by that phrase, and then the word of the Lord came unto me. The word of the Lord came unto me. I mean, the word of the Lord was big in Jeremiah's life. In Jeremiah 5.14, he says, Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, because... Ye speak this word, behold, I will make my words of thy mouth fire, and this people would, and it shall devour them. Man, that's power. Y'all still believe in the power of the word? I know you do. A 
just felt like insulting you. I feel mean today. I, I, I apologize. Yeah, we believe in the power of the Word of God. But maybe we need to believe in it more. Maybe we don't have any idea just how powerful it can be. Do you think that might be a possibility for us? Yes. I think it is for me. Jeremiah 23, 29 God said to Jeremiah, Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh a rock in pieces? You see, folks, I don't know, it takes me a long time, but I finally came to the place in my life that, and I fully realized that I cannot persuade anybody to come to Christ. I can preach the greatest sermon in the world, but if God doesn't bless his word, it's not going anywhere. It'll kill rather than quicken. I can't do it. Without him, I can do, Jesus said, I, you can do absolutely nothing. Nothing! And we're trying to do too much, ladies and gentlemen, in our own strength. And we don't realize it. It's a very subtle thing. But I want the power of that word that breaks the rock in pieces. Jeremiah had a rough life. He prophesied that Judah would be chastened by God for their idolatry and carried away captive by the Babylonians. That began first in 597 B.C. and then the second captivity or stage of it in 586 B.C. And because of the severity of Jeremiah's message, Jeremiah suffered much more than I think he ever expected. He suffered under the burden of obedience to proclaim a message that was painful to, the, to himself and hateful to the hearers. And he wept for the burden that he had for the people that he loved. And he loved them so much that it was painful. And he said in Jeremiah 9, 1, Oh, that my head were waters and mine eyes a fountain of tears, and I may weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. And I read that and I say, God, where's my burden? What's wrong with me? And I think that's what I've been going through the last couple of weeks. I'm no good without a burden. But I've started praying for a few people fervently and God's given me a burden for them. Because I want God, I need for God so badly to prove his power and presence to me once again by working through the lives of these people. I cannot do anything to advance the cause of Christ in my own flesh. God's going to have to do it. But folks, and I'm rambling a little bit, but it's necessary this morning. There's parts that I love about having a burden because it makes me feel closer to God. Then there's another part about having a burden that I would like to just be done with. Because I know what I have in Christ and I want, I want those that I'm burdened for to want it like I want it. To know what it is that I've experienced, to know how far God has brought me through the years. And sometimes I'd like to just give you my whole testimony because it's because of what God's done in my life that I'm here today. But I can't make people want it. But God can. If the power of God comes upon my life. Man, I'm, I'm talking to some of you this morning. I'm talking to all of you this morning. You got you got some law, you got loved ones that are uh, estranged from God. Some of them are just flat out lost and dying on their way to hell. And I don't know how much time we've got left, but we better get to praying. And you better start getting into the word of God that the presence of God may come upon you. I understand, folks, we're all filled, we're all indwelt by the Holy Spirit, but that doesn't mean we're filled by the Holy Spirit. And, 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 there, and the presence of God is all around, but I'm talking about the fullness of his presence, the, the full impact of his presence upon your heart and mind.
Yes, we could, Jeremiah could say what he did about his broken heart. Because when the word of the Lord becomes a part of you, the fullness of God's presence follows along close behind. And that's why Jeremiah majored on the word of God and, and was willing to bear the burden. So I've shared this with you before, but I'm going to go into a little bit more detail here. Maybe you'll understand where I'm coming from a little bit more this morning, but I've, in, in times past, I've talked to you about uh, in, in my years of college, and I was there for a while, because I did undergrad and seminary work. There's one lecture that stands out above all lectures I ever heard at Bob Jones University under a man by the name of Dr. Terry Rude. It was uh, a, a semester course in the historical books of the Old Testament. I took that course because the other courses that I wanted would, would not fit into my schedule, so I, I, I just, this, was, this course was available, so I took it. it. Ended up being one of the best courses I ever took. Well, we walk into class one day and uh, Dr. Root says, after a few introductory words, he says, it's time to get into the theology of judges. <laughs> I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, man, that will, this, I'll try to pay attention, but already this sounds like it's gonna be pretty dry. The theology of judges. I don't know. I, my heart needed some work. He began going through the book all in one in one lecture. I'll try to relive or recount much of what he said because I want you to feel the full impact. I've just referred to it briefly in the past. Anyway, there are five seasons of revival in the book of Judges. And uh, the phrase, the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, occurs in connection with all five of these revivals. Each time the prayer comes after a long period of oppression, they, and, and each time the cycle repeats itself. They forsake the Lord, they serve the other gods of the, of the nations, of other nations, then they come into bondage to those nations, uh, whose gods they serve after years of oppression. They repent, they repent and cry out to God. And each time God hears them, and each time God sends them a savior, a deliverer. This is the story in brief. They served the king of Mesopotamia eight years. And the Bible says that when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer, Othniel. And then they were in bondage to Moab 18 years. Now I'm really condensing this thing. And the Bible says that when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up a deliverer, Ehud. They were in bondage to Jabin, king of, of Canaan, 20 years. And the Bible says that the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, and Deborah and Barak were given in response to that cry. Then in Judges chapter 6, verse 6, we read, and Israel was greatly impoverished. Yes, they were impoverished for seven years to be exact because of the Midianites and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord and the Lord sent a prophet and Gideon. And then they were in bondage to the Philistines and to the children of Ammon for 18 years. And the Bible says and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord and his answer was Jephthah. It's, it's the same story. It's the same cycle each time. In all cases, except the last revival, we simply have the record that the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And what all after that they said, we really don't know. But in this last case, in this last revival, and, and judges, before you get to Samson and his personal battle with the Lord of the Philistines, in this last revival, the whole prayer or much of the prayer is recorded for us. Would you look at Judges chapter 10, verses 10 to 16?
And it says, And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, saying, We have sinned against thee, both because we have forsaken our God and also served Balaam. Well, here we go again. Humanly speaking, I'd be pretty worn out by now. If I had a child that kept committing the same sin over and over and coming and apologizing and, and asking for forgiveness over and over and over again for the same thing, I'm not exactly sure how I might respond as a father. I know how I should respond if I were godly. But Anyway, they, they forsaken God and Balaam, and the Lord said unto the children of Israel, did not I deliver you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites and from the children of Ammon and from the Philistines? The Zidonians also and the Amalekites and the Maonites did oppress you. And ye cried unto me and I delivered you out of their hand. Yet ye have forsaken me and served other gods. Wherefore I deliver you no more. No more. What does that do to you, people of God? Verse 14. Go and cry to the gods which you have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. And the children of Israel said unto the Lord, We have sinned. Do thou unto us whatsoever seemeth good unto thee. Deliver us only, we pray thee this day. And they put away the strange gods from among them and served the Lord. And his soul, the Lord's soul, was grieved for the misery of Israel. You know, the revivals in the times of Judges show that prayer occupies a principal part of the return of the people to the Lord. And this word cry is suggestive of the type of prayer that issues in blessing. It's the word most frequently used in the Old Testament uh, to, to, to describe prayer. It speaks of distress, distress, rather. I don't know what I was just saying there, but we cry out when we're in trouble. And when Peter was seeking in the water, he cried, Lord, save me now. And these people had been in uncomfortable circumstances for years, but now the full weight of the situation uh, did not hit home until now. But now they felt the shame and the disgrace of their condition, and they began to cry out to the Lord. And these people said, only deliver us, we pray thee this day. And that word cry also speaks of the feeling of helplessness. Have you ever been there in life before? Yes, you have. They wanted a leader. They wanted a savior. They wanted a deliverer in the worst way. You know, I, I've learned this from experience, but when people are, and when men are in bondage to sin, they are often unconcerned for a while. They're content with their bonds. They do not feel the shame and the disgrace of their position. And as long as they are in that condition, there is no deliverance available for them. But when they realize the power and the tyranny of that to which they have sold themselves, when they discover the havoc that is playing with their constitutions, their minds, their character, and their futures when they see that it is imperative for themselves to be set free no matter what the cost and when they wake up to the fact that they have no power to free themselves and they need a savior then if they will just cry to the Lord he will help them as the Bible says and that right speedily Let us notice what this cry of the children of Israel included. That was confession, we have sinned. Please hang in there because this, this is so important and I'm done. But we got a few minutes longer to go. They said, they confessed we have sinned and the confession 
was not in general terms. It was very specific. They said, we have forsaken our God. We have served the Baalim. We have served Balaam. They knew wherein they had sinned and they acknowledged this particular offense to God. And when you confess your sin, it doesn't do any good. And I mean, these last two weeks I've gone before God and I've not tried to be in general terms with him. I told him, God, I said, you know what? You're, you're having to use one flawed individual. And God, there's a whole lot that's wrong with me, and I got specific about it. Because I've got to have some kind of relief. This is not the first time these people had acknowledged their transgressions. You know that you know, by the time you get to Judges 10, they are backsliders returning to God, and return to God is never an easy thing. In this case, the Lord said he wouldn't hear them. Again, let me read verses 11 to 14. And the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Did not I deliver you from the Egyptians, from the Amorites, from the children of Ammon, from the Philistines, the Zidonians also? And the Amalekites and the Manites that oppress you, and he cried to me, and ye cried to me, and I delivered you out of their hand. Yet ye have forsaken me and served other gods, wherefore I will deliver you no more. Go and cry unto the gods which you've chosen, and let them deliver uh, you in the time of your tribulation. We take God so much for granted, saints. Would it make any difference to you if God came to you one day and said, I will answer you no more? Would that devastate you? Because it would devastate me. I never want God to give up on me because if he does, all hope is gone. God practically told those folks that day, he said, you're just, you've made a convenience out of me. You don't come to me until you're desperate, until you're hurting. I mean, so he could have said, I'm just, I, I'm just tired of being taken for granted. Go, go find help from your own gods. That was a perfectly fair proposition. Nevertheless, though it's harder to come back to God when you've done so time and time again, Dr. Terry Root stood up before us young preacher boys that day and he said, in every situation, no matter how desperate it is, return is always possible. So these people persevered and they said, we have sinned. Now, if you need a major breakthrough, this is what you're going to have to pray. You're going to have to come to the place in your life. If you want to be restored to God's presence and fellowship and power, you may have to tell him this. Do thou unto us what seemeth good unto thee. Let me tell you what. When God heard that, he knew the people were serious. The people were saying in so many words, God, we've come, you know, we, I know we've taken you through this cycle so many times. We've forsaken the Lord. We've gone and served other gods. And then we go into oppression and enslavement and we start hurting. And when we're hurting, we come to you and we cry out, Lord, we need to be saved. We need to be delivered. And you've always delivered us. And God, we wouldn't blame you this time if you didn't answer and didn't deliver. But I hope that's not your answer. I hope that you will deliver. And God, whatever you need to do to us to take us back, do it. Don't matter. Don't care what the cost is. Uh, it, it makes no difference what price we have to pay. Just do it. 
Because the worst pains in life cannot be worse than the pain of being apart from God. So they pour their hearts out to God. Deliver us only, we pray thee this day. And they put away the strange God from among them and served the Lord. Let me tell you, they valued forgiveness and deliverance, and they became much more urgent into their confession. They added action. They gave a guarantee of their genuineness in that they gave up the things that were wrong, and before deliverance was even granted, they began to serve the Lord once again. And as the Bible says, we are to bring forth fruits unto repentance or for repentance. So the cry of the children of Israel moved God. He could still be moved. And I don't care how far from God you are today, your God can still be moved by you. Amen. So they pleaded with God, and we read his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. One man wrote this. To me, it was profound. He says, God is unchangeable, but he is not immovable like a rock. His heart can be touched. Genuine repentance, distress, strong desire. These things touch him, and he responds to them. And if you really are anxious to be better and to be delivered, God will come to your aid. Where there is a will, God will find a way to bless. Those that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. Now, I don't know what happened exactly because it was getting near the end of the hour. And Dr. Terry Rude continued on talking about something. But after what he said up until that point, and when he got to that point where he said, God said, I'm done with you. And then the people came back and said, God, I don't, whatever price we've got to pay, just come back. Let us come back to you. I don't know how to put it into words. If you're still tuned in, I'd already seen God do some wonderful things through prayer in the Greenville County Jail and other places. But I'm going to tell you, folks, the power of the Word of God hit me that day unlike any day before up until that time in my life. I sat in that classroom, and ladies and gentlemen, and God knows I speak from an honest heart. I experienced that day something that I had never experienced before. In that classroom, there was the fullness of God's presence descended into that room. It was almost as if I was now the only person in the room, the professor continued to profess that I didn't hear anything that he was saying. I just knew that God was near and that the Word of God had absolutely come alive. And I really understood stood for the first time in my life the power, I mean the real power that's in the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God. And when he, and, and when he said what God said, that I will hear you no more. I will help you no more. It devastated me as if I were the victim. People of God, on that day, it was as if, now I'm no spiritual John, but don't misinterpret what I'm saying. I'm just telling you how it felt. It felt like I had ascended to the heavenlies like Paul once did in that moment. There was such a feeling. I mean, we've got 
We've got even the saints of God seeking worldly pleasure to satisfy uh, their lustful needs. And on that day, though, I was raised to a level of edification, elation, and euphoria that I had never experienced before. It was the greatest moment of my life. And I'll never be the same because of it. That's where I come from. And so you wonder why. And I got a lot, I've had a lot of problems to overcome just like you have, ladies and gentlemen. But if you wonder why, I always urge you to meditate on the Word of God. It's because when I'm right with God, my moments are spent seeking another God moment. What happened to me that day in the classroom, I wanted it to happen to me again. More than anything in the world, I want that to happen to me again. And it has. Not long ago up in Luray, I just alone with God studying in Colossians chapter 2, and God broke in and broke my heart. And I just, I wept over what I found in the Word of God. A couple of times in the last three months, I, oddly enough, in a public place in Krispy Kreme, I would be meditating on the Word of God and and it would catch me totally by surprise, but there would be such, God, I came across something, God revealed it, and out of the blue, there was such a swell of emotion that came over me that I just wanted to break down and start crying like a baby, but I thought, yeah, these people already think I'm crazy enough. You know, so I, I, I did my best to restrain myself, but I had to get out of there. And if I were any better of a saint of God, then I could experience this every day. But I've seen it. I have been there, at least on occasion. But I would like to live in the presence of God because it is such an unbelievable power to it. I cannot describe it to you. You must experience it. D.L. Moody was a tremendous evangelist. He, uh, see, I, I, let, let me just share with you a, a man that kind of knew what it was to live in God's presence. The indescribable, overwhelming power of God's presence. F.B. Meyer was, and y'all are familiar with that name, many of you, you've read his good books. He was a close friend with D.L. Moody. He wrote some biographical information, in fact, about D.L. Moody. Hopefully most of y'all are familiar with Dwight Lyman Moody. Born in 1837, died in 1899. Uh, born and died in Massachusetts, although he did a most of his work in Chicago. An evangelist in the United States and in Great Britain. He went over to Europe quite a bit. Anyway, this is what F.B. Meyer wrote. He said, Mr. Moody once told me that a number of poor women in Chicago who heard him speak said to him one day, you're good, but there's something you have not got. We are praying that it may come. Moody was taken back a little bit. I guess his pride got the better of him as well as a young man. Several days later, one afternoon, he was in New York and he was walking along when an ir irresistible impulse came upon him to be alone. He looked around. He thought, where could I go? What was to be done? 
He remembered a friend living not far away, so into his house he rushed and demanded a room where he could be alone in prayer. And there he remained for several hours. And there he received the fullness of the Holy Ghost. Are we not commanded by Ephesians 5 to be filled with the Holy Ghost? This isn't a Pentecostal doctrine, ladies and gentlemen. This is a biblical doctrine. And that day he was filled with the Holy Ghost. And when he awakened from prayer, it seemed as if the walls were on fire. When he returned to Chicago and began to speak, the godly woman who had spoken to him before time said, You have it now. The wonderful power which Moody henceforth exercised over his fellow men, he owed to that touch of fire. F.B. Meyer said it never left him. That's what I need. That's what I want. My life is almost over. What time I've got left? May I dwell in the presence of God. You know what? Moody once heard a man say over in Great Britain, he said, the world has yet to see what God can do with a man fully consecrated to him. And Moody replied, by God's help, I aim to be that man. And he was because he had the power and the presence of God upon everything that he did. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm done, but I, uh, I'm thankful for the days that I've spent at Bob Jones University. And it was back in the 70s. They were taking a strong stand for the Lord. The man, of course, that founded Bob Jones University was uh, Dr. Bob Jones, Bob Jones Sr. But just hear me out, because I really am done after this. The, uh, I don't know how much you know about Dr. Bob Jones Sr., but he was a rare man. And early in life, I don't know, God in the sovereignty just raises up people, but Dr. Bob Jones, as an extremely young man, began to understand the power of God's presence. Now get this, because you can find it hard to believe, but Dr. Bob Jones Sr. was converted at the age of 11. By age 12, he was the Sunday school superintendent of his church. I mean, would you want to put a 12-year-old in charge of that? By age 15, he built an outdoor canopy and at the age of 15 started a church with 54 people. You know, preaching out in the middle of the woods somewhere. By age 16, he was sure of God's call to preach, and he began going to churches all around and preaching, and none of the churches could hold the crowds that would come. Dr. Bob Jones Sr. in the early 1900s was the and, and see, you, you may not realize this, not having been there, but uh, I mean, for the first half of the 20th century, um, it, it, he was one of the best known evangelists in the United States with the possible exception of Billy Sunday. Dr. Bob Sr. would preach to crowds of 15,000 and more without a microphone because they didn't have them where he was speaking, you know, it's just these big open-air crusade buildings to be packed. 
hundreds and thousands of people being saved. Many people thought Billy Sunday was the preeminent evangelist of the day, and you know, who cares and who am I to judge? But Do Billy Sunday, who was close to Dr. Bob's senior, said, Billy Sunday himself said, this is the greatest evangelist that's ever lived. And look at what God did with just one man that really was totally consecrated to him. I've got to finish up, but you're sitting here and you're thinking, I'm only one person, what can I do? Or right away, you've put limits on God. Bob Sr. was one person. Billy Sunday was one person. D.L. Moody was one person. But the key to their success is that they found the power in the presence of God. And it dominated their lives. And God used one person to bring, in D.L. Moody's case, a million people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. You may be one, but be one with the power of God's presence upon your life. Father, I pray you bless and drive this message home to our hearts. May we leave this place as different people from this day forward. May we pant for thee as a heart after the water broke. And I pray that we may find thee. I pray that as we draw nigh unto you this day, that you would draw nigher to us than you ever have before. That we may understand from experience what it means to live in the power of your presence. And God, if we could just have that power, then we could get some serious things done for you here in this church. So Lord, open our eyes that we may see. And I pray that you would keep the burden for the lost upon our hearts this day. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Please turn your hymn books today to hymn number. Well, let me see. Just as I am. 270. 270. I, hey, Colton, I need, need this mic here. 270, just as I am. I'm not going to make any invitational appeal. If God's power is in this place right now, then he's working in your hearts. If you want to come to the altar of prayer, if you want to plead and cry out to God to give you his power and a greater fullness of his presence, then you're welcome to do so when the invitation is given. So let's just go ahead and stand and sing hymn number 270, Just As I Am.
upon us, so I continue to pray. You continue to pray that God would revive us. Brother Joey, would you close some prayer today, please? Father, I thank you so much for allowing us to gather here this morning. Lord, your power is something that we need so desperately, yet we are so stubborn often to seek after it. Lord, as a surgeon has to cut away the bad parts to get to what they need to, Lord, so you need to cut away the bad parts of us that we may serve you fully. Father, that desperate cry, Lord, that was given unto thee, Lord. Take whatever you need from us, Lord, whatever you have to take from us. Just please come back to us. Lord, that desperation is something that we need for you. I pray, Lord, that we would call after you, that we would seek after you, Lord, with such a longing. Because we know your power is there. We feel it. We see it, Lord. Yes. We cannot live profitably without it. Right. And I pray, Lord, that you would just burden our hearts to seek after this, Lord, that we will not forget what we've heard today, Lord. And I ask these things in your Son's name. Amen. 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 Amen.